In season off season, whatever the season, this is the place to be for Huskers Talk every Tuesday night, folks. 7 Eastern, 6 Central. Bring a friend or two or 50. You've got the full 60 minutes in front of you, so still a good time to gather a crowd here for Nebraska Football Talk with Justin Adams, Cheesy Corn Sports, the Big Ten show right here on YouTube. Justin and I getting together to talk Huskers again. Justin, what's going on tonight? Not a whole lot. Just uh, you know, defensive day in in terms of the uh, press conferences today. So talked a lot about the offense. Not not terribly too much on the defense, just because that was the strength last year. We've been worried about the weakness last year. So it's a uh, nice day to talk defense. Plenty of uh, good content to check out here on the Voice of College Football GBR. So Justin doing a bang up job. Check out uh, some of the recent posts. Justin and I. We're reviewing those uh, during a meeting uh, just here in the last couple of days. And I was reminded of, oh, did that, did that, did that film session here. All a lot of good stuff that's not outdated. It's still fresh. It's still uh, ready to be consumed there, folks. So check it out. I guess the first thing that comes to mind with the defense is the improvement of the pass rush last year because it was just not a good thing. You'll be rolling your eyes when I throw out this number because you've heard it a million times. There was a string of seasons. I don't know if it was four or five, something in that range where Nebraska was literally last in the Big Ten in sacks almost every year with yep. some just anemic sack totals like 22, 24 for an entire season. And they certainly improved upon that portion of the, the defense if we want to get started there or whatever your first impressions were from today's uh, press conferences. No, we we can get started there. Um, yeah, one of one of the uh, I, I think even, you know, dating back to 2022, um, there was at one point, I think, a season where we might have finished not even in double digit sacks. And I don't know which which year it was, but it was it was abysmal. And that was one of the biggest things coming into last season because we know with Chenander's defense, Chenander ran this Ben don't break style of defense. And the Ben don't break style of defense was not really formulated on concepts of, you know, stopping the drive. It was more so we're going to maybe give up yards. We're going to give up, you know, first downs, but we're going to try to play aggressive and force a turnover. And it didn't work. And there was no pass rush. There was no physicality there. It was just like, and, and the players almost lost the ability to, you know, play gap sound, to tackle, to pursue. It was over pursuit. It was overly aggressive in terms of playing defense just kind of recklessly. Right now, there's a brand on the defense where it's a, a aggressive but physical style but you still maintain you know your pad level you still maintain your defensive fundamentals you're still gap sound and that was one of the biggest reasons that when Chenander left and um I think it was Bill Bush took over the defense it you know simply all he talked about was being gap sound and working on tackling working on pursuit just the basics and and even that little bit improved the defense now we're looking at, you know, a couple years removed from that, and the team is physical. The team is tackling. They're getting hats to the ball, and they have a pass rush. And, and I think that was the, the, the biggest thing that people really don't realize is how important a pass rush is to the rest of the defense. It takes all of the pressure off of the DBs, the linebackers, makes our job so much easier because when you have a quarterback – you know, getting pressured, rolled out to his right. Okay, all of a sudden, you're more worried about the right side of the field. Pressure, roll out to the left. Now you, you're you more worried about the left side of the field. He's more likely to make a mistake if he has to throw the opposite side of the field, et cetera. And, you know, just with pressure in the quarterback's face, he's going to have to force some throws. So that makes every level on the defense that much better. And they were talking about, you know, this year really focusing on, you know, working certain details with some of these linemen, uh, defensive linemen from last year, um, you know, Tony White specifically, or I'm sorry, Terrence Knighton specifically mentioned, um, you know, that that 
Riley Van Poppel, stronger. He's speeding up to the game, getting live reps. Um, Lynn Hart, they're expecting him to make a big jump. Um, they said he's just got to be more assertive, but he's a student of the game. He's He said he's an engineering guy. He's just always in the film room. Um, then you have Prince Will Jamari. Like, it, it's a very deep room. Um, the, the thing they were working with with Nash Huttmacher that was interesting to me is they're really working on him as a three-technique guy. Typically, your three technique guys are going to be, and for what for for those that don't know, what a three technique is is basically you're playing the three gap between the A and B, and you're going to be shaded to the guard's shoulder as opposed to lined on the outside shoulder as opposed to lined up specifically on the nose. Um, and you you can determine you know by odds and evens where they're lined up straight or whether they're lined up you know on the shoulders. So the even numbers are going to be lined up head up on the. Uh, offensive linemen, the odd numbers are going to be when you're kind of in the gap. And typically for a three technique, it's your twitchier, more agile linemen. So it's interesting, you know, Nash is getting to play there. I think part of what they might be trying to do is because, you know, Nash with the wrestling again, like I mentioned last week, wrestling, I think is probably the most brutal and grueling sport as far as training goes. So him coming in and they've even talked about having kind of back Nash off a little bit just because of the wear and tear that could potentially his body could take, you know, being on the mats and stuff like that. And just in that grueling training and him trying to put the weight back on and stuff. And they, they say he's doing a really good job with that, but they might be trying to take advantage of, you know, the little bit of a, a leaned out frame, maybe trying to add some more muscle, maybe trying to, you know, make him a little twitchier and then try to expand his game to where he can play, you know, in the gap. And what that's going to do is basically that's going to get him to the quarterback quicker because you can't double team a guy in the three gap. You have to double team, you know, the nose tackle <clears throat> has to, or the center has to pay attention to who's ever lined up over the nose, which is typically a bigger guy. And so that's going to open up Nash in those gaps to be able to get to the quarterback a little easier. He's lined up by the edge rusher. So that's going to be causing some problems. So I, you know, I really like them talking about specifically focusing on Nash in the three technique spot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like Nash is so good as it is. They were talking about, they even, you know, he's getting reps, he's sneaking and get reps. He wants to get reps, but they're having to back him off a little bit. And so it'll be interesting to see how over the course of the spring, he still develops and how they kind of use this, this, you know, frame and the, the conditioning has to be night and day different, even because he was talking about, you know, wrestling seven minutes straight on the mat of just full nonstop go, go, go. And so there's going to be a lot of things they can do with him. And then they, when they, you know, they're putting the weight back on him, they're probably taking a different approach to make sure that they put the right, right weight on him, lean him out a little bit. It's not going to be a rushed thing. They, you know, they said they want to get him back to 315. Shouldn't take too long. There's typically a rebound in weight after you cut water. There's going to be this huge, huge jump as you put water retention back on, and then it's going to kind of level out. And so they're probably just, you know, making sure that his body, while it was depleted for the wrestling, doesn't get overworked too early on in spring. And they're going to add more, you know, as as the uh, spring goes on. So that's something that'll be interesting to watch is how he progresses there. <clears throat> but they said outside of that, you know, he's taking on a leadership role. He's coaching on the sidelines. So, you know, Nash Huttmacher is going to be, um, he's going to be a force next year. And and him and Ty on the inside, you know, they said with Ty, they're working on getting him better on third downs, which, you know, was kind of a thorn in the side of Nebraska last year. Just got to get better at getting off the field um, early on in drives. And so it's really nice that last year, it was more so they were figuring out what even we had in the defensive line like do we have enough to formulate a pass rush and how do we get a pass rush out of this group and now that they were able to bring kind of the potential out of this defensive line now they can start fine-tuning certain details in these guys you know james williams they're talking about you know working on him being a first and second down guy but that his body needs to catch up to his mind which is fine because you got you got the guys like nash and ty that are going to be there and help mentor these guys and help help slow that down a little bit and help help them figure out how to kind of balance that out you know get the body up to the mind and get the the body working to where the mind is on the field because again football is a lot of instincts 
and not thinking. If you're thinking, you're a little, you're going to be a little late. So it's 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 building those instincts, but also getting your body in the right place to be able to uh, react. And right now, it seems like there's a lot of different body types and different groups. We'll we'll go over that when we go over the cornerback room. And these guys are just going to be cross trained left and right and moving all over the place. But this defensive line is going to be a a solid strength of this team. Um, and I'm loving what Knighton was was talking about and how he feels about this room because he was talking about you know he wants seven eight nine guys who can be a starter and have that rotation have that depth get those fresh guys out there get the young guys out there and uh, keep developing and uh, Jamari Butler Prince will like all those guys he, he's talking about each person brings a little something different so they're going to be moving these guys all around that line and it's going to cause some headaches because they're going to be playing the matchups they're going to be. You know they're going to be playing matchup on the defensive line. And he was talking about if, if if we think we have a matchup advantage over this guy by putting you know tie on him or or etc. They want to make sure that these guys can move around this line and play anywhere they need them to, which is why they're kind of cross training and, and kind of expanding those skill sets with those guys. Anytime you bring up wrestling, what I think of is the, here's here's my long and illustrious wrestling career. This is about as extensive as I get with wrestling. Drop my mouse. Is, <laughs> is that when I was in junior high, and I don't think this goes on very many places anymore. We had wrestling in gym. Like mm. when my son was in high school and junior high, they didn't wrestle at all. But we had wrestling. We had like six weeks of wrestling. That's awesome. In gym in seventh and eighth grade. And so you're right. It's it's one of the most grueling. And this this is just this is not anything close to competitive wrestling. So mm -hmm. I'm not even thinking that. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd see my buddies who were on the wrestling team for school. Yeah, you know, running around uh, the halls and everything with the the bags on. And you know, yep. back in the old school days, they'd put on like trash bags and stuff to just yep. work up a sweat and all that. Good, yep. But the thing that I remember is number I I've never been that tired that way. It's it's it was similar to you know when you're trying to work yourself back to be an athlete in a particular sport and you do a lot of running and weightlifting, but it's nothing like when they say football condition versus just being in shape, being in football shape, they're two different. You can run a zillion miles, you can do sprints, you can do everything. But once you get on a football field and you start doing, you know, Hogan's alleys and hamburger drills and that kind of stuff, you get worn out regardless of how good a shape, that's what it reminds me of. And I remember having wrestling matches against like three other dudes who didn't know what they were doing either. And yeah. like, I was, a, I was a decent athlete. So I like threw the first three guys around and then, and we had like a little tournament in seventh and eighth grade. But once I ran into a wrestler, mm -hmm. you know, forget it. You know, yep. I was wiped out, had yep. no idea. He made me look like a fool. Yep, exactly. And, and, and to your point, like, like you said, that's just kind of like, you know, uh, general, just kind of physical education type of wrestling. And, and, uh, so kind of what you were feeling there, just think about that, you know, against the highest level, against the biggest guys, and then trying to come back and, you know, come back from your body depleted and having to cut weight. And he had to cut weight in a short amount of time. So it was a quick weight cut and a quick weight cut will deplete you. Like you will feel run down. You will feel sluggish on top of already the training that you're having to do because naturally i mean carbohydrates fats feed glycogen to the muscles glycogen in the muscles is what fuels your body and so if you know he's cutting down in carbohydrates and all that stuff and then he has to build it back up his body's going to be more prone especially if he's building it back up quickly his body's going to be more prone to injury just because once your your muscle and stuff like that kind of comes back if it comes back quicker and outgrows you know, grows too quick for the ligaments or the muscle gets too strong for the ligaments, then you can have ligament issues. So that's why they're being extra cautious and extra careful about probably putting this weight on slowly and then slowly integrating him into the live reps. So that way that doesn't happen because on top of that, you know, the body's wore down and it takes a little bit of time to recover. So I, I like the the strategy they're using. Um, Terrence Knighton said it's going to be Matt Rule's call ultimately on when he gets, you know, back to you know, more of the live contact reps and stuff like that. But um, 
the actual plan they have in place because they, you know, with the injuries last year, they need to keep an extra eye on how they're handling, you know, certain things like this. Um, I think they've they've kind of learned their lesson and they're just being smart because the thing is, when you look at the end of the day, Nash doesn't need a ton of work in terms of live reps. You got these young guys here. He can be a mentor over there, a coach, you know, kind of on the side and get them reps. He has so much game experience. He's such a talent that he's going to fine tune little aspects of his game, but he doesn't have to get out there and kill himself this spring. Now, Justin, this is what came to mind when you were talking about what an excellent pass rush can mean for a football team. And I've always thought in addition to, especially as the game has evolved into a passing game, the pass rush is the most important component, I think, in, in college football. Yeah. Um, to reverse that, you could say the offensive line is, I mm -hmm. think, the most important unit, but that's because they have to protect the most important player on the field. Yep. Uh, so I think of it this way. Think of this, folks. Take 100 pass plays on defense for Nebraska against its opponents. Just take a block of 100 pass plays. And regardless of how good your pass rush is, you're not getting there every time. You're not affecting the quarterback every time. They're, they're too good. They get the ball out of their hands too much. The lines you're playing are too good. You, you just can't. But so let's say a good pass rush, not a great pass rush, but a really good pass rush gets home. And when I say home, I'm not talking about a sack. I'm talking about affects the passer in some way 70% of the time. Say 70 out of those 100 plays. And let's say what where Nebraska was a year, two, three, four, five years ago in that range. Let's say, and we'll even be kind, we're getting home 30 times out of 100. For those 40 plays, understand that when the pass rush doesn't get home, that's why you have guys that can tackle in space, covered guys that can break up passes, all that business. But you have just eliminated 40 plays out of 100 where it doesn't matter what anybody else did. They can blow the coverage. They can get burned. They can never, we'll never know if they would have missed a tackle because every ill in the back seven is wiped out because of what those four dudes were able to do or one dude was able to do up front and get to the quarterback. Yeah, and another big aspect that people don't really kind of take into account there is, you know, you have, let, let's look back at the Chenander defense when we didn't have a defensive line that could get off blocks and we didn't have a defensive line that could put pressure on the quarterback themselves. When you have a defensive line that can do that, you can put four on four, right? You don't have to then bring stunts and take other people out of their positions. Um, what was happening with Chenander's defense is, again, it was an aggressive style of defense, but it seemed like every single time to get pressure on the quarterback, they'd have to bring some kind of delayed stunt. And for people you know that don't know what a stunt is, it's some kind of package where you know a linebacker is going to be on a little delayed blitz and try to shoot the gap, something like that. And when we were doing that, it always came a half step late. Like the pressure would get there, but it was always like a step or a half step late. And so it really wasn't affecting the passer enough or wasn't affecting. It, it just seemed like the it was there to be had, but the defensive line was not opening up the gaps quickly. And then it was such a delayed thing to where to finally get the opening that they wouldn't even get there in time. So that's another aspect, too, is when you have it, it's such a valuable thing when you have guys that can get off their blocks and get there when they are just one on one, you know, then you don't have to bring those stunts. You don't have to move those linebackers out of position. You don't have to bring the Jack and Rover down. Like it gives you a little bit more flexibility. You can use those stunts in more of a specific time frame in the game. And not just because we can't get pressure on the quarterback, we have to run a bunch of stunts. Those stunts were put taking people out of position. And that was opening up huge, huge gaps in the defense. And we were just getting gashed left and right because. Yeah, and, and you talk about the offensive line being the most important, which I agree. But the reason the offensive line is most important because how important the defensive line is. So those two work hand in hand. You know, the, the offensive line wouldn't be as important as it is unless the defensive line was such a big aspect. Um, and so that, that was, I think, the, the 
the biggest thing that gives confidence for next year, and especially with the cornerback rotation, not necessarily knowing who's going to be, you know, the second corner, et cetera. Um, the, the fact that you have more of a sure thing at defensive line, it, it really makes that decision, I guess, a little bit less of a risk, right? You know that you have a defensive line there that's going to help take pressure off of these guys. So if you make the wrong decision, it's not as, I guess, damning as if you didn't have a defensive line and these guys are just going to get beat, which I don't necessarily think is going to happen, but it just helps when you have other position groups lacking behind them that 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 being there makes those decisions much more easy and you can rotate these guys a little bit more and kind of get more reps and stuff like that because there's going to be situations there where that defensive line is just going to take a lot of the pressure off them completely because offensives are, offenses are going to be really, really keying in on trying to stop our defensive line, which is going to really open up the linebackers in a secondary. And linebacker core is really good too. Hey, everyone. Hey, Tonight and going forward, you will be able to watch uh, Justin and myself live on Instagram, Facebook, and X. And many of you are doing so right now. Uh, of course, we would love for you to join us on YouTube. And the reason we want that is therefore you can engage in the uh, live chat. But hey, if you're going to catch us on Instagram, Facebook and X, that's awesome as well. Just keep in mind, you can join us on YouTube and take part in the chat. Uh, we've got an Amazon link. It's in the description section of every video here at the Voice of College Football. If you grab the Amazon link, you will not be able to notice any difference from what you're doing right now but it helps us grow and build the channel doesn't cost you a penny we appreciate that all right justin was there anything else from the uh defensive talk today yeah so they they went over a few position groups um but you know there's certain aspects that tony white was mentioning and and we've talked about this before when matt rule was talking but it, it's it's really them hammering down on this this standard that they've set, right? And last year, it was so much about the coaches learning the players. Not only that, they had to learn the players, set the standard, and then try to get these players to reach the standard while being a new staff, which is tough, right? You're trying to retain players with the new staff being in there. You're trying to learn the players. You're trying to see what you're going to have see what talent you have, but also set a standard in there. And I think that's why in the beginning, you know, they were talking about last year being more so it's on the coaches and then next year it'll be on the players. And it seems like every coach and even the players are kind of echoing that sentiment when they talk. Um, you know, he, you know, Tony White basically made it, he, he's basically of the belief and the staff is of the belief, like you have to win every day. And each day we reset. And so you have to live up to it or you don't. And the, the people that live up to it, the majority of those days are going to be, be the people that lead. It isn't about whether you're junior, senior, freshman, sophomore, whatever. If you're going to come in and do the things they ask you and you're going to live up to the standard that they're asking you, you're going to see the field. And um, so right now, like Tony White talking about, you know, they have the, the different teams set up and, you know, on the different fields. And so right now they're still trying to learn because people are talking about like, you know, who's going to get the cornerback two spot, who's going to play where. Uh, and they're not even close to that point yet, just because of the fact that Tony White is talking about how, you know, the, everything's so spread out with these teams being all over the field that he's asking other coaches, like, are we even good defensively? And the reason he's asking that, of course, is because he doesn't see it all together just yet, you know, and when he does see the one, sometimes he's talking about like the communication needs to be improved and stuff like that. Um, but however, they did talk about the fact that the team's up to speed and doing things they were at the end of last year, meaning that it's night and day compared to where they started spring last year versus this year. You know, the tackling, getting off of blocks. Um, he said they went from the X's and O's to really just kind of the the brand and style of football that they're trying to play here and make sure everything is being done the same way. And that's that's kind of what I talked about before when when you know the stat came out of Nebraska retaining 77% of their their talent it's that's it right there it's everything is being done the same way and every single coach on this staff all of the players when they speak it's all the same kind of way 
that they're talking about. And what that does is that's going to make sure that everybody's on the same page. These guys are not, everything that these guys are being told is legitimate. And this retention and, and the way these guys play for each other and the way these guys play for the staff comes off of that. And, and I think that's the biggest thing that we're seeing this spring as compared to last spring is the relationship, not only that the coaches have with these players, but the relationship the players have with the players now. I think this is, you know, the most I've, in a, in a little while that I've heard players talking about other players to the level they do and talking about them in the way that they do. And um, it, it's it's nice to see that we have a team of guys that trust the guys next to them, that, that trust the one of 11. Because in previous years, it didn't seem that way. There was always... There was always some standouts and there was always some guys that weren't pulling their pulling their weight. There seemed to be some friction. That seems to be all gone. And they were able to do that in one offseason. They're they're getting this brand of football, which is just physical. And we knew when Matt Rule came in, it would be more physical. But the amount of time they've been able to turn some of these players around that were brought, you know, were from the previous staff, add this physicality and have their mentality the way they do. Um, you know, this defense they're talking about, they want to be the number one defense in the country next year. And and I'm not saying they will be, but this defense is going to be such a stark contrast from what we saw last year in terms of just effort and understanding the game. When you understand the schemes more, you can play a lot loose and a lot a lot more free. Again, it's instinctual and not thinking. And I think that's the biggest thing that we're going to notice from the defense year over year is that they're going to be playing more instinctually this year. And uh, I, that's going to lead to a lot less mistakes. And we'll also understand that, of course, while it seems a bit of a stretch, and, and as you just mentioned, yeah, it would be great if they fielded the number one statistical defense in the country. But And the stats do reflect the level of play. But, yeah. hey, be tough. you could be the third number three and really be the number one the stats are the stats and they can be somewhat skewed yeah. but this is a defense that last year in total defense was number 11. Mm -hmm. they were 11 in total defense they were in yards per play number seven in the yeah. country in yards per play defense and so <laughs> that's even with that Michigan game too. They improved considerably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They they uh I want to see what their past not their raw numbers in in terms of past defense, but their efficiency rating, because that's more telling for yeah. sure. They were 14th in the country in pass efficiency defense. Yeah. Uh under 60% completion percentage. Uh, only gave up 14 touchdown passes, had nine picks. So real good numbers there. Yeah. And and the defensive back uh room, you know, they they have uh they're gonna be doing a lot of movement this year. Of course, we have the Jack and Rover position, which kind of play all over the field as it is. Um, but you know, the difference in body types that you have at the cornerback spot, and this is why like I was a big fan of of uh Bly Hill, you know, kind of getting the second corner spot is because he is 6'3", long and rangy. Um, some of these other guys are a little bit smaller. Uh, you have, you know, Ethan Nation, who's 5'10". You have uh, Buford, Mario Buford, even getting rotated in there as, as a freshman, 5'11". Um, and you got uh, Hardzog, who's 5'9". Jeremiah Charles, 6'0". Uh, Jeremiah Charles is the guy who uh, won the dunk contest. And, um, and it's one of those things, it's like they... A couple of these guys are probably can rotate over to corner. I mean, Hartzog has been working safety. I mean, Hartzog was cross training safety last spring, and so I would not be surprised to see Hartzog be a safety. Um, but I'm really liking Bly Hill to win this second cornerback spot. But the but the fact that they have you know they listed you know five names and a couple of them being these young guys, Bly Hill just still needs to you know get caught up on the the schemes in the way that Nebraska plays there's a different standard here <clears throat> like he kind of mentioned that when he was talking about Stefan Thompson <clears throat> and I mentioned that last week that when Rule was talking about Stefan Thompson 
as you know, he's a linebacker, but um, he said the transition wasn't as smooth as they wanted it to be. And, you know, in my opinion, that's partially because they, they hold Stefan Thompson to a higher standard. He's already played with Tony white at Syracuse. They're talking about the standard at Syracuse is different, et cetera. We well, have Bly Hill who's coming in from an FCS school. And so he has to kind of learn the division one style of football, but not only that, he's coming on to, like you said, a top 15 defense, you know, top 10 potentially defense. And so um, it, it's all going to be a matter of if Bly Hill can just quickly learn the concepts. Um, I think he's, he's going to get that spot, but it'll be an interesting battle there because they're not really showing much of their hand on this. They, they listed, about five guys for the cornerback two spot. They listed about five guys for the uh, inside linebacker spot. And so a lot of these positions right now and these guys that they're listing at these positions, they're all probably subject to move too because, again, it's about it's about body types. If these guys are shorter, stockier, you know, they can play – they can play um, safety. You know, a lot of these safeties, they want to be able to move around and even drop down in the box a little bit. And just like the linebackers, they want to move the linebackers. They want to be able to move them down to the edge. And uh, so when listening to them specify certain guys for certain positions, I would completely lock that into stone because positionless offense, kind of a positionless defense with Tony White's 3 5 it's just a lot of movement. So, um, but I like Bly Hill to be that second corner I have kind of since we got him, just because his rangy frame, his lanky frame, he's going to be able to, and he can he can move well, he can get up, so he knows how to use his frame. So I, I, I'm excited to see Bly Hill kind of, kind of get up there. And then moving over to the inside linebacker spot, you know, he talked about uh, Mikael Gebeyer, uh Vincent Shavers, Javen Wright, um, Dylan Rogers, Stephon Thompson. You know, I still think Stephon Thompson's probably going to be the guy, but I'm a huge fan of Javen Wright as well. Um, Javen Wright, you know, had really good flashes last year. He got better as the season went on. You know, he, he even played, he played some nickel corner. He played, he moved around a little bit. So I'm really excited for Javen Wright to potentially make that jump. Big guy, you know, he's tall guy, six, five. Um, and so Stefan Thompson, Javen Wright really interests me there. Vincent Shavers, you know, they're saying Vincent Shavers is kind of a difference maker right now. Um, Dylan Rogers, who was, you know, red shirt, played on some special teams last year. Dylan Rogers, they were talking about how he's getting a lot stronger. Um, so very, very good to have some options there at the inside linebacker. But again, some of these guys, you know, Stefan Thompson has the ability to move down to edge. You know, he, uh, I'm not saying position move to edge, but they can use him in some concepts to where they can put him, you know, outside linebacker or move him down to the edge. So these guys that don't necessarily get in the line inside linebacker spot, they're still going to, you know, see some playing time uh, over the field uh, or on the field. And I think that's the big focus this year is now that they have some depth and depth and some of these freshmen got a lot of reps last year. Now they feel like they have, the depth that they need to be able to kind of move these guys around a little bit more and not risk losing the depth. Uh, last year, it was a little bit more spottier in terms of the, um, a, you know, the, the defense had the, the returning experience and they'll have returning experience last, uh, this coming year, but there's a lot of true, uh, true freshmen, red shirt freshmen that are mentioned in these, in these, uh, different things. So it's nice to have that depth so we can see how much they really want to move them around on defense and get, you know, see what we got with some of these young freshmen. You know, um, if if we can get a guy like Buford in there, um, uh, his true freshman year, then that is very telling because we we do need some of these guys to step up these uh freshmen because you know, some of these guys on the defense, they're upperclassmen. And so there's gonna be an exodus of players leaving on the defensive side. So this is going to be a real test to see what we have in this recruiting class that Matt Rule has brought in just to see what, you know, what um what different things and how they can develop because I know they're going to get a lot of playing time this season because staff has mentioned this time and time again. You only get better by playing football. You only get better by playing live reps. So the actual playing time on the field is very, very valuable um to them. So in a way it was a blessing in disguise with 
the amount of freshmen that had to play last year. And, and it, it's evident by the fact that they trust a lot of these freshmen. You could tell. And again, yeah. Stephon Thompson uh, at a full season, 13 games with Syracuse last year, 53 tackles, four tackles for loss, one and a half sacks coming to Nebraska, but needing to step up in regards to his conditioning to be ready to go according to yeah, Tony White and Matt Rule's standards. Yep. Was there anything on that depth chart that either surprised you or you think was worthy of note? So, I, you know, I think the biggest thing was just kind of some of the names they mentioned that are kind of coming to the forefront. Like, you know, a guy like uh, Amario Buford getting – reps at the cornerback two spot as a, as a true freshman and, and seeing some of these guys that, you know, like um, Jeremiah Charles, for instance, like he's a very, very athletic guy. He needs to refine uh, uh, some of his skill set. But even the fact that he was mentioned in there, um, that just shows because, again, you know, Matt Rule is a big, big proponent of just athleticism and teaching teaching the skill set. And um, he's a guy who's, who's extremely athletic, who – if they can get him, you know, fine tuned and really work some of his technique, he can be a big, big difference maker on defense. So I, I just think it was really a, hearing a lot of these young guys and, and some of these guys that they're mixing in there at these positions and some of the guys who are standing out to them because, um, you know, with with the defensive talent the way it is and and how good the defense was and the returning talent we got, the fact that these freshmen are making noise and sliding in the cornerback two spot is, is big time. As Patriot No Job is telling us, hit the like button, everyone. It's easy to do. Please hit the like button before we finish tonight's show. Mm -hmm. yep. Unless you and, wanted uh, to hit anything else on the defense, uh, Justin, I know that you had uh, come across a conversation this week that was interesting to get the yep. backstory on the Luke McCaffrey decision and all that went down there because I certainly have some thoughts about it myself, but uh, I'll let you take it away in regards to talking about what uh, Adam Carricker uh, delivered this week. Yeah. So there was just a, a clip that, you know, kind of was, was bumping around Twitter of uh, Luke McCaffrey and, and it, you know, there was this belief that um, he didn't necessarily want to move positions, but then he went to rice and play wide receiver um, so people were kind of like, well, move positions there or whatever. Um, but he said that he was never asked to move positions by frost. And, and there's, it's just one of these things where it's like words, you know, who do you believe? Because on back then there was this, you know, Christian McCaffrey was, you know, kind of, um, I guess a little upset about the fact that they were asking him to move positions which would lead me to believe that that actually happened. So hearing Luke McCaffrey saying that didn't happen, and if it didn't, that just shows, because I, I've talked about how Frost was before. Frost really, really was set on his guys. Frost did not like to mix it up, did not like to, you know, bench guys or replace guys. You know, Tommy Hill really, you know, had some struggles under Frost and really just lacked a lot of the effort and the hustle that, he has now and you know frost really didn't want to want to change things up and even at the detriment of the defense it's like he picked his favorites and and i think with luke mccaffrey i he didn't use him in the way that he needed to be used and that was another thing where it's like frost is so set on like you play quarterback we're putting you at quarterback and that's the biggest difference between these these two things too is is now guys are moving all over the place. Luke McCaffrey, if we would have moved him around the field, he would have been a stud. You know, at the times he was moved around the field, you know, lined up in the backfield, put out receiver, he did he did really well. Um, so it, it's really hard. I just don't know. I, I'm I don't know who to believe just because I, I can't take anyone at face value. But it was just weird because Christian McCaffrey did seem to have an issue about that. But uh, yeah, that's he didn't have the arm to be a starting quarterback. Yeah, he really didn't. He uh, was always a slider frame. He just – and he was twitchy. You know, he was one of those he, – he reminded me kind of of uh, Logan Smothers. You know, Logan Smothers was very similar where you had to really kind of 
have certain packages to run Logan Smothers at running back. He really didn't have the the frame. He didn't have the arm strength to be a starting quarterback, especially in the Big Ten. And because you know, Rule talked about this before. Certain, especially at home games, you know, the wind starts kicking down there, and you need a big bodied guy with a strong arm to be able to push that ball through the wind. Um, and McCaffrey was never going to be able to do that. So the fact, if that's true that he never asked him to switch, that's just complete negligence on his part of, of being able to evaluate talent and put them where they need to go. And again, that's one of the things that I love about the staff and what, what the staff is doing differently and what's make going to make this team better is the fact that they check these guys out everywhere. And, and we, we're having position changes all over the place, you know? And it's something we haven't seen before. And, and getting true freshman reps, because that was another thing. The, the true freshmen weren't really, or the redshirt freshmen and these younger guys weren't really getting reps. He stuck with the upperclassmen. And those guys didn't get the development they needed because we've talked about this before. Nebraska getting off the bus was probably the fourth most talented team in the Big Ten when Frost was the coach there. As far as just like recruiting rankings, you know, the size of the guys, like they looked bigger than some of these teams, but they just didn't play to their size. They didn't play to their ability. And I think that was partially due to the lack of development because, you know, he didn't get these guys on the field. He didn't get them rotating reps. It was just um, a train wreck as it was. And that's why you had guys like McCaffrey leaving, you know, and that's why you have guys now staying because they are giving these people looks everywhere and, and kind of developing them everywhere, which is going to help them in the future, get to the NFL, et cetera. To me, your Luke McCaffrey story, courtesy Adam Carricker, of course, was a contrast in the Scott Frost regime and the Matt Rule regime. I just can't believe that there's going to be a situation that's going to go down under Matt Rule like that. If a player decides to move on, it's because playing time, NIL, I just want to see what this situation's about and I want to go there. Not, we really didn't communicate and we didn't have an understanding. Just Matt Rule is so proficient at, this is what we're doing. Okay, we want to know what are your goals and objectives and we want to be on the same page so we're understanding of what you want, who you think you are, what position. And if there's any kind of changes that we see, we're going to make sure we're communicating that to you and you understand the expectation or the thoughts or ideas or suggestions we have about changing what you are on this team. Just that whole communication breakdown just seems to be classic Scott Frost. Yep. Yeah, and, and the more stories that we heard about after in terms of recruiting and how he was handling certain things, communication was not a strong suit. And communication with, you know, he really didn't connect with the media and the fans. That's why, I mean, sometimes, occasionally, but towards the end, it was kind of like, this is on us. You know, he was always, this is on the staff. This is on the staff. This is on us. This is on us. And there was no that none of that player accountability. And so, like, like, you said it's just a stark contrast and a stark difference to how they're to how they're handling this team. And um, to Fongway's uh, question here, what was the bigger blunder, bringing in McCaffrey to play QB or bringing a turnover machine, expecting him not to turn over? Considering um, McCaffrey was, you know, kind of probably a third string, I don't think that impacted too much. When you bring in a, a bad first stringer and uh, as bad as Sims. I would say that's probably worse. However, on the grand scheme of things, comparing Matt Rule to Scott Frost, Matt Rule got that was the that was the most important decision that he had to make, and he got it wrong. But there was a lot more that he got right. So I don't necessarily hold that against him. He was trying to get somebody in there who's going to be able to push Casey Thompson, and then all of a sudden Casey Thompson left. There was unexpected things that happened. You know, that was supposed to be kind of an iron sharpens iron. Casey was supposed to stay and battle it out and had the confidence that he could win the job. And he probably could have if he stayed, all things considered now. But yeah, he, he just kind of got that wrong. But there were some circumstances that went into that. No quarterback coach, et cetera. But it, it, Jeff Sims was not going to be the guy regardless. You know, Jeff Sims, he is what he is at that point. He's an athlete. 
with uh, bad accuracy and a bad arm. And well, he had, I mean, he had somewhat of an arm, but he was just too, he wasn't refined as a pastor. He didn't know how to go through his progressions. When, when route concepts would open up, he wouldn't really see the opening. You know, there was times where we would have deep crossers down the field and those deep crossers, you know, they're to kind of get the safety, you know, let's say they're in cover one, right. Um, or even cover two, like it's supposed to get the safeties crossed up and the corners crossed up. And there were a few instances where those would work. You would see those work and he would just immediately out of the break, be throwing it to the guy that's double covered. And that is just a, a, a decision-making issue because he wasn't instinctive as a passer. He was one read and try to get out. And, you know, with, with the inability to catch the snaps and all that stuff, he was just, it was never going to work. He was never a good passer. They wanted him up to 65% completion percentage, but he was 55% at Georgia tech. It was just a mountain to climb. And a lot of things went wrong in the process, but yeah, uh, at least he was able to get Raiola and may, I mean, he more than made up for it by getting Dylan Raiola for sure. Speaking of which folks, um, we released our big 10 quarterback rankings over on the national channel. So please check those out. And of course, Dylan Rayola has yet to take a snap in college. So where do you rank him? Well, my approach was taking a similar approach to the way I rank coaches is that if there's a new coach coming in, he's done nothing good. He's done nothing positive. He's done nothing wrong. He's, he's neutral. Yep. So, of course, those guys are generally going to go to the bottom. However, if there are coaches that I don't believe are getting the job done, not meeting expectations, I'll actually rank them below the new coaches because their tenure to that point is negative as opposed to neutral. Yep. Okay, when it comes to Dylan Rayol, I ranked him ninth in the Big Ten out of 18 quarterbacks, which is a pretty... Decent rating considering yeah. there are experienced quarterbacks behind him yep. that aren't bad. Uh, Ethan Calcumanis, who leaves Minnesota to go, to go to Rutgers. There's one example right there. Uh, Ethan Garbers, who's at UCLA and won a bowl game last year. But, um, you know, there's a lot of projection out of that ranking. Of course, uh, I'll go back to my national quarterback rankings the year that Bryce Young eventually won the Heisman Trophy, and I had all sorts of people all over me because I ranked Bryce Young as the second best quarterback in the country to start the season. They said, how can you rank this kid the number two quarterback in the country? It's only thrown six passes. I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm trusting here. This is a projection. So most of the rankings are based, obviously, on performance to date and production. I do my best. This is how I rate at least uh, Justin is to take the other, this is impossible to do, but I still make an attempt to take the other players out of the equation. So if Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback in the NFL and he suddenly gets thrown behind the worst offensive line with the worst weapons, his numbers are going to suffer, but I'm still going to try to just watch him and evaluate him. So a lot of people make quarterback rankings and they base it on and talk a lot about the complementary pieces in the offensive line to say this projects to this this great stat line, and that's what it's going to be. I try to take that out of it best I can and just say these are the quarterbacks one through eighteen in my viewpoint at this point, regardless of the weapons that surround them. And I've got Dylan Rayola at nine. Yeah, and I I think that's completely fair because. Even having him at nine, like you said, that's that's probably higher than some other people have him just because he hasn't played a snap. We're just starting to hear some things about, you know, that he's doing well, but not a whole lot of information, not a whole lot of, uh, you know, film out on him. We have a little bit of the, um, uh, the Polynesian Bowl to go by, but it, it's one of those things where it's like you really have to take into account the ability that he has and the recruiting ranking that he has because again more often than not those five stars pan out and 
you know, you have guys like Ethan Kaliak Manis who kind of are what they are at this point. You know, Kaliak Manis wasn't real, and I had him. I thought he was going. I had Minnesota. I thought, and I was completely wrong. I thought Minnesota might be a dark horse in the West, and uh, I thought Kaliak Manis was going to be better. Than he did, but but a lot of the quarterbacks, like you said, are new. And he's going to be behind some of these guys. You know, you got Dylan Gabriel probably as a top quarterback, you know, without a doubt. Um, and I think that Riola has the opportunity to climb into that top six, five range um, this season. So, yeah, I think nine's completely fair. And, and just looking back at some of the, you know, five star recruits at the quarterback position, the top recruits, you know, more recently, I feel like they're hitting more often than not. Um, but it remains to be seen. So I, I think nine's completely fair. I, I did a quarterback ranking. I can't quite remember where I had him. Um, but I believe it was somewhere in that range. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It's just it's one of those things where it's hard and you can project based on and that's that's what you can do. Like with coaches, for instance, like coaching rankings. Um, yeah, with the coaches, you can judge based on the team success. Like I had Greg Schiano. Like I think like fourth or fifth in my coaches' rankings because what he's doing at Rutgers is he only he can do that at Rutgers the the physical style that he brings because of the you know the jersey style is very physical brand of football but he brings the best out in those guys you know Rutgers was the bottom dwellers and and nobody thought they would ever make any traction in the Big Ten they were just kind of like hamstrung coming into the Big Ten in every way and. So, you know, to your point, it's not about necessarily the the records or anything like that. It's about the ability to coach and bring the best out of your players. Same with the quarterback. It, you know, you can have a quarterback out there like, you know, a Riola on last year's team where we didn't have a ton of talent. And yes, you know, we had talent, but injuries and, and not a lot of experience. But he could go out there and make those guys better. And you have to kind of base it on that. How much better does he make these players around him? And and how much of that is him? You know, and I think that's kind of the way you have to rank these guys. But right now, with him not having any uh any experience, we'll, but we'll see over the course of the spring and and uh but everything's gonna be very vanilla. We're not gonna see much until we start hitting the games. And those first six games, like I said, they're a little fa- they're pretty favorable. So we could see, you know, some development and flashes from him very, very early on. So, Justin, while I search for my coach's rankings, where did you have Matt Rule? I believe I had him. All right. So I had him at six. Um, Originally, I think I had him around. I think I had him at six. It was either five or six. I bumped him up a spot. Um, But, yeah, I think it was five or six. I'd have to go back and verify. But just because he... He made the team better, yes, but we need to see the second year jump. And I think once we see that second year jump and we know that they're going to make the jump, you know, because we we can talk about it all day, but until we see it on the field, because we've been burned in the past, you know, pretty much every offseason, um, we're offseason champions. And we're we're kind of to the point where it's like, we want to see it on the field. And, you know, if he can make the jump, you know, if he can get eight, nine wins, then he's going to climb up that just based on what we kind of talked about before, where it's like he made this team significantly better in a short amount of time. And that has to be taken into account. So what you're seeing there, folks, these are just my notes. So there's a lot of scribble there. It may not make any sense to you. That's just to keep me on track and my talking points. So here are my coaches rankings for 2024 released a few weeks ago. If you want to check out the videos, they're over on the national channel. So this is a tough process because people can call in and criticize on one coach and say, why is he 18? He should be higher or why he's 32. He should be lower. And got to understand that, most of these guys are really good at what they do. So you put a 40, and and so I'm ranking all the Power 5 coaches. So there are 69, 68 in conferences, then Notre Dame that makes 69 teams. So you can see a 40 next to a coach's name and think that me, 
in particular doesn't think much of that coach. Well, that's not the case. And there's also, in my opinion, just a small margin between most of these spots. Um, so as I see it, and then the other couple factors in here that make it difficult as well is, of course, the resources at these schools are so wildly different. Yeah. Uh, to compare what somebody can get accomplished at Ohio State versus at Northwestern in the same conference is night and day. Uh, pardon the pun. Yeah. So, and then my last point will be, I don't rank on legacy. Yeah. Um, so let's say there aren't any great examples right now of this, but let's say Bobby Bowden and Joe Paterno were still around and they were in their last couple seasons. Well, all time, you would put them up right near the top. If you were coaching, if you were ranking their resume, their entire history, but I would be ranking them right now. How good are they right now? And they would be 30th, 40th, whatever, uh, even though they're, they're all time greats. Mm -hmm. So if we weed through this and just look at the big 10 coaches, I've got Ryan day, number six in the country, number one in the big 10. Yep. That's where I had him. I've got uh, what surprised a lot of people, Jonathan Smith coming in from Oregon state at number two in the big 10. Then we've got uh, Lincoln Riley at number three in the Big Ten. I've got him number 11 in the nation. I've got Dan Lanning just one spot behind. Um, I had him at two. In the you Big got Ten. Lanning at two? In the Big Ten. So the other portion of that is while I say that it's a in-the-moment ranking yeah. and the past doesn't count, of course the past <laughs> weighs into your – if if a little bit, yeah, it you know it, a coach doesn't get dumb all of a sudden, yeah, you know he just because he has a bad season, you don't just say okay, he was the number four ranked coach in the country a year ago, and I'm dropping him to fifty because he had one bad season. So right. all of it's nuanced. Yep. Uh, so I've got landing at four. I've got Luke Fickle at five. And I think I had Matt Rule. I think I had Luke Fickle at five, and I think I had Matt Rule one spot behind Fickle. Okay. So I've got James Franklin at six. James Franklin was three, yeah. Then I've got Kirk Ferentz at seven, number 23 in the country. There's PJ at eight, number 25 in the country. Then I've got Matt Rule at 28. I had him 23. That's what that means in parentheses last year. Down oh, so he moved down. To 28. I, I, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, because the end of the season there, you know, coming into the season. But like, I, you know, like you said, it's very nuanced. And, and some coaches probably outperformed expectations that were behind him. Exactly. That's the other thing to take into consideration. It's not like you're just saying oh i'm 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 evaluating that rule in him only yeah. and he did a bad job and i'm dropping him five spots no there could be all sorts of other things going on with other coaches who ascended past him Michigan just temporarily State. for one season or we'll see what happens in the future but it's you know it, these guys aren't ranked in a silo yeah. so yeah i i in no way did i believe that matt rule did a poor job last yeah. year but the the Jeff Sims. Well, 28 is no, that's no slouch of a ranking either. Not at all. Yeah. Out of 69. And again, I think almost all these guys are really good at what they do. Absolutely. Uh, Sharon Moore was difficult, of course. Yeah. Because he's only coached three games, but hell, <laughs> you know, he beat he won. Penn State, Maryland, and Ohio State. And, uh, but he didn't coach during the week. Yeah. Uh, but then the other thing is, he was one of the best offensive line coaches in the country, then became one of the best offensive coordinators in the country. And also consider that when Harbaugh was suspended the first three weeks of the season, and they did kind of a round robin of the three assistants, uh, and the other two are excellent. They've, they've moved on to the NFL, so they're really good at what they do. 
Sharon Moore obviously showed enough during his audition in September for him to be the undisputed guy to get the selection when the whole season was on the line. Yeah. And like you said, they had some talent assistance to the point where it's like, you know, some of the assistants, when they lost unexpectedly, you know, an assistant or two, like it was a big deal. And that just shows you the, the caliber of coach that Sharon Moore is, um, because he beat out those guys. Like you said, a couple of them went to the NFL. And, um, so yeah, I mean, he's a very, very good coach. Um, but yeah, it's one of those wait and see things. He did get the the wins, but I think you do have to put him a little bit up there. You know, part of when I was doing my rankings, I think I put a little bit too much stock into um, the team that they currently have. You know, for instance, you know, I, I or the the fact that they don't have the experience of being a head coach. So I did drop Shiro more a little bit, but. You know, I think I went a little bit too far into the fact that they lost talent and what I'm expecting of this upcoming season as opposed to just the coaches themselves. And so absolutely, I folks. you're right. And I'm kind of, I kind of need to adjust. Well, I'm almost so also reminding people I don't pretend to have the perfect formula. These yeah, are yeah. not perfect rankings. Uh, I think they're good. I think yeah. they they come with some knowledge yeah. and perspective, but I in no way, just like my team rankings, yep. would I Makes ever sense. say that these are the perfect rankings, that they can't be argued? Of course they can be argued. Uh, so I kind of lost track of where we were in the Big Ten. I think Sharon Moore, nine? Yeah, I believe so. Then we got Jed Fish at Washington, comes in from Arizona, did a heck of a job. The the disaster and dumpster fire that he took over at Arizona, my goodness, yeah. they were awful. Yeah. And flipped the roster, did a great job. And so we'll see from there. But um, it is just one big season at Arizona. So yeah. I, I'm also cautious about the guys that have, okay, did it once. once. Sonny Dykes did it once. <laughs> and then yeah. they dropped back to five wins. Uh, so Jed Fish must be at 10. And then I got, and I'm still in the place where I think these guys are really good coaches. Like yeah. Brett Bielema, I still think is a really good coach, but 10th in the Big Ten doesn't sound impressive, but uh, got him at 35 overall. I, I'm moving Bill O'Brien to last just because I'm a Texans fan. <laughs> so he's the he's last for me. Well, uh, I don't know what to tell you there. Was he that Poor bad? Brian. With the oh, Texans, my. he ruined us. He he got he, they they doubled him up as a GM, and he ruined us. Well, I'm not ranking him. I wouldn't I know, rank I him know. as a head coach based bias. on what he did as a GM. That's just my personal bias because I couldn't stand him when he was with the Texans. So I admit that's 100 percent bias and not realistic. Okay. But I'm salty. <laughs> Here is a perfect uh, example of what we were talking about just a second ago. You would think that since you had Shiano, what, fifth? Uh, I think I had him fifth, yeah. Actually, I actually had Kirk Ferentz fourth, him fifth. Okay. Shiano fifth, and I guess I've got him 11th, I think, mm -hmm. is where we are. Like, that sounds like it's wildly different and we disagree. Not really. Like, I think, shoot, between two or three and 12, I think we could go. Yeah. I, I just, yeah. I, like, I don't see a great separation between uh, Luke Fickle and Greg Schiano, for yeah. example. And so, the, the hardest part is that there's so many new coaches and there was so much turnover. Yeah. So here, here's the biggest wild card of them all in a sense. So this may sound ridiculous, but I think you'll understand based on what I said at the beginning of what my criteria is, is based on, what they're doing right now, you could say David Braun's the best coach in the country. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true. Yep. Just based on what he did. Now, it's crazy what he did. None of us really think he's the best coach in the country, but he took a team that everyone thought was going to win one game, and he went eight and five and won a bowl game. What he did was incredible. Yeah, it was. Uh, so that was a difficult ranking. Uh, yeah, I wanted to give him a ton of credit for that. But of course, I'm not going to say, oh, he's one of the 10 best coaches in the country based on one season. Could have been a flash in the pan. Yeah. Type of deal. Now, if they go like eight and four this year. Oh, yeah. He's moving up. 
then wow. Uh, so that must be 12. Then I've got Michael Oxley at 13. Um, I he's he's done a nice job at Maryland. Yeah, some some inconsistencies though, but then we've got uh oh Dion. Who's next here? Uh must be where are we? Our next coach Kurt is Kurt Signetti. So it's his first year in the big time, but he did a heck of a job at James Madison. So I'm I'm guessing you probably have Ryan Walters last as well. Uh we'll have to wait and see. I don't yeah, I believe I do. Yeah. Where are we? 13? I have yeah. lost track here. Then I've got uh Who's our next Big Ten coach? Ryan Walters. John Foster. Oh, so Ryan Walter. Okay, I see it's 63. Okay. Who have I missed here? Anyway, um, we Deshaun oh, Foster. Well, there's Deshaun Foster. Oh, that's right. I had Deshaun Foster last, and I had Ryan Walters one spot above him. Okay. Yep. That's where I'm at on that. Because that was a terrible hire, in my opinion. Ryan Walters. Desh- Deshaun Foster. Deshaun Foster. Yeah. Yeah, I just would think that UCLA could do better. Especially when they were floating out names like Tony White and stuff like that. Yeah, the Deshaun and Foster really. You're moving to the Big Ten. You've basically been thrown a life preserver, and yeah. you could almost thank USC for bringing you along, and you're getting a full. Like, think Oregon and Washington are getting half shares, yep. and UCLA is getting a full share. Um. And uh, I have completely lost track of time. <laughs> so it's all good. I, I need to run only because I'm hosting the Michigan show tonight. And <laughs> totally forgot. So I'm 10 minutes late for the Michigan show. Uh, folks, we appreciate you being here. Join Justin on the Big Ten show. It's right here on YouTube. Just put in Big Ten show and you'll find it. And uh, of course, Justin's going to be cranking out some great content here on the Nebraska show as well. Yep. Content is going to be increasing now that we got some football back. So awesome. Thanks, everyone. See you back here next Tuesday.